The trouble with old steam locomotives. Part 12, the basic machining of a new piston and rod. As you can clearly see, the old one looks pretty grim. I'm going to start off by making the piston rod. This is a piece of 5 16 of an inch diameter stainless steel. At the moment it's in the chuck and I'm facing across the end of it. In the next part of the job I'm going to cut a 5 16 by 32 threads per inch thread on the end of this piece of stainless steel. I'm very pleased to announce that my lathe is working perfectly again. No slipping of the belts and the three phase converter is working to perfection. And it's threading time. I'm using some of this, it's called Castrol Easy Tap. This is an extreme lubricant that helps the cutting of threads in metal. I want a nice clean thread on this part, so I'm putting plenty on. Normally in this old Boxford lathe, I would leave the belt on the counter shaft in the middle pulley position. I find this speed to be very useful for most applications, except for threading under power. What I've done now is put it on the lowest speed, so now the chuck is revolving in back gear at 20 revs per minute. I suppose I could thread this part by hand, but it's quicker under power. And now I have an accurate 5 16 by 32 threads per inch thread on the end of the piece of steel. That's the piston rod made. Now it's time for the piston. So I'm fitting a piece of cast iron into the chuck. In this part of the operation, I have two options. I can part it off like this. The problem is though, I'm too close to the chuck. The parting tool has to be this close to the chuck. If the parting tool comes any more this way, it's just not going to work, I will show you. This is a recipe for disaster, as you can clearly see. As soon as I touch the rotating piece of cast iron with the parting tool, it moves out of alignment. I could centre drill the end, use a life centre to support it, but there's a quicker way. My trusty old Draper horizontal and vertical metal cutting bandsaw. This is in horizontal mode, and the only problem is, because of the way the vice works, I need to put some packing behind the work and I've made this packing from a piece of bar and a piece of brass. So the metal that I'm cutting is held very rigidly and with the video speeded up, in no time at all I cut through the metal. And then it's over to the lathe as usual, first of all, as always, face across the front. For a precision job it's never a good idea to hold cast iron in the chuck by the uneven rough outside diameter. And after facing across the front to make sure that this is perfectly square, I then turn the piece of cast iron longitudinally. I need to make a one and a half inches diameter piston, but at the moment I'm not cutting the cast iron anywhere near one and a half inches in diameter. All I'm doing is truing up the piece of cast iron so I can turn it round in the chuck and then I can start drilling, threading and machining it properly. Thanks to the miracle of video, the job's done. I've turned the part round in the chuck and once again, as before, I'm facing across the front. No need to take a really deep cut. I'm not sizing this up at all at the moment. I'm just taking a rough cut. This close grain cast iron is from Blackgate's Engineering and it cuts absolutely beautifully. It's time now once again for the longitudinal cut. Under no circumstances at this stage must you take the size down to the finished required diameter. You need to leave it about an eighth of an inch bigger. Here I'm comparing the size with the original piston. And now that I'm satisfied that this is still oversized, I'm cutting all the way down. And just to make sure I haven't made a mistake, I'm checking the size with the caliper. Now it's time to centre drill the front part of the cast iron, followed by drilling the hole using a 7 seconds of an inch diameter twist drill, followed by threading it with a 5 16 by 32 threads per inch tap. Here's a finished thread with a bit of swarf in the hole which I'll blow out before I fit the piston rod. And now it's time to part off the piston. And once again, not only is this piston blank oversized diametrically speaking, I must stop using these big words, it's still too thick. The final sizing of the piston blank will be done when it's mounted on the piston rod. Here's the parting off process, nice and slowly, I don't want to mess up at this stage. Once I've parted off the piston blank, I put it back in the chuck. And once again, I'm facing across the front. But once again, I'm leaving the piston blank too thick at this stage. Keep watching, you'll see why. This lathe does not have a powered cross slide, so I'm turning the handle when you see me doing any facing. With a bit of practice, you can get this dead right. Guess what's coming next? Some Loctite 603. I'm applying plenty of 603 to the thread on the piston rod. 
By holding the piston rod in the tailstock chuck and rotating the main chuck, I firmly attach the piston rod to the piston. The Loctite 603 is just a belt and braces approach. Now using a micrometer, it's time to measure the thickness of the original piston. Now I'm going to cut this piston to exactly the same size as the one that's been removed from the locomotive. In this process, I will also turn off the centre part of the piston rod. It's only a very small amount, but I need the piston rod to be entirely flush with the front part of the piston. This piston rod is made from stainless steel and it's quite hard. So rather than stressing out the part and putting a lot of pressure on with the cutting tool, I'm reducing the size of the piece of stainless steel incrementally. This might look like a large, strong part, but don't forget it's only held into the chuck by the 5 sixteenths of an inch diameter piston rod. The best thing to use for doing jobs like this is a collet, and if you have a proper collet set, they're ideal for the job, but luckily this chuck is fairly accurate. And in this case, even if it wasn't, it's spinning the piston rod, which may be a little bit off-centre, but by the time I turn the outer part longitudinally, the outer diameter of the piston will be concentric with the outer diameter of the piston rod. I'm still facing across the front. Here I'm doing it in one go to get a nice smooth and even finish across the front of the piston. Everything's in order when I bring the cutting tool back towards me, because I'm stood to the left, it's not cutting any more metal. In the next part of the operation, I need to centre drill the piston rod. I do not want to risk turning the outer diameter in case anything goes wrong and the piston moves in the jaws of the chuck. And after centre drilling, the piston rod now looks like this. And now with the live centre pressed firmly into the hole in the piston rod, the support is far greater than if the piston was just held by the 5 16 diameter rod. After a few facing cuts, this piston is exactly the same thickness as the original one. And now's the part you've all been waiting for, or maybe not. I'm turning the piston to its final diameter of one and a half inches. You can see now why I needed to leave the piston blank a larger diameter than I finally needed, because it's quite off center. But as I mentioned a short while back, once I've turned the outer diameter of this piston, it will be concentric with the piston rod. If, as an experiment, which I'm not going to do, I'd turned the piston to precisely the right diameter before fitting it to the piston rod, and I took the piston rod out of the chuck and tried to fit the piston into the cylinder, it would probably fit, and all would be well until I fitted the cylinder cover, and then the piston rod would be off-centre. If you ever find yourself having to make a new piston and rod for a steam engine, make sure that you get the sequence of events as shown in this video correct. Unless you have a very accurate collet system, never ever remove the job from the chuck until it's completed. I'm really taking my time with this part. I'm not even speeding up the video. This is running 100% in real time. I got a comment from a viewer. I'll tell you about some of the comments just from a conversation point. I know the conversation is one way, but it's a conversation point. This particular viewer commented, Sadly, I don't like the way you always make your renovations look like new. Yes, I could agree with that, but I do not always make my renovations look like new. I build and repair miniature steam engines for my customers. And most of the time my customers say to me, yes, please rebuild it and make it look like new. I want it to look good in my display cabinet. So when the customer gets his steam engine back, not looking like a piece of excrement with metal bits sticking out at random angles, the steam engine looks good from this point onwards when of course it starts to age naturally and the metal tarnishes, etc, etc. Please be aware that I am not in the antique business. I mend toy steam engines, generally speaking, albeit big boy steam engines, so I too like them to look good. But for instance, when I renovated a 1903 Bing clockwork train, I did this very sympathetically to its age and condition. You know, I really can't win making these videos. I either get comments like this from the customer who says that I make them look like new, then other customers who nitpick about tiny steam leaks. Back to the job, have I removed too much? I set the caliper to exactly an inch and a half. I need to turn this piston about three thou under an inch and a half, which should match the cylinder. So for now, I'm going to continue turning this piston blank to the required diameter. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. 
please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.